from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Sonia Sones, you probably all read her, that's why you're here, uh, was born in Massachusetts. She went off to Hampshire College nearby, and she already knew how to make animated films when she went to college. And so she was so good at it, she got sent all over the country teaching in schools how to make animated films. Um, she taught film at Harvard. She was a, a film editor. But when she had her first baby, she wanted to stay home and spend more time. And that's when she turned to writing and specifically poetry. And her first book came out in 1999, Stop Pretending. And it won just about every poetry award you can think of and uh, best books for young adults and teenagers. Today, we're celebrating her newest book, there we go, to be perfectly honest. And also she has a new box set of three other books, What My Mother Doesn't Know, What My Girlfriend Doesn't Know, and one of those hideous books where the mother dies. And all of these books are enriched by the fact that she kept journals. She has about 115 journals, and so can remember what it felt like to be a teenager, and even remembers how to express it. And the other thing is, her filmmaking is really evident in her books because each poem, she thinks, is like a little scene, and I feel the same way. They're very visual books. Uh, what My Mother Doesn't Know has been on a challenge book list. It's number 31 on the American Libraries Association most challenged books. I read through it twice, and I cannot figure out why it's challenged, but Sonia has a lot to say about it. Thank you very much. Are you ready? I just had to show you how great my skirt twirls. Oh my god, I love my skirt. I also love my, my media escort, Gina Jones, the great Gina Jones. She has made me so comfortable all day, and I've only gotten a little soggy because of her great care. So. Um, do you mind if I take your picture? You look so great. All right, wait a sec. Would you please wave at me? Like... Wave. Woo! And now you guys in the middle. Woo! Ben, more, more. Woo! Yeah! All right. OK. <sighs> OK. So um, I know a lot of authors read from their actual book, but I don't. I, I'm too. Um, vein for reading glasses, and two chicken for LASIK, so I use size 24 font. <laughs> That's what I do. I'm an expert. Um, all right, so first of all, I want to ask the timer lady, that timing, is that like, does that still leave me 10 minutes at the end for questions, or is that including questions? Including questions, okay. Okay, so you can all hear me in spite of the rain and everything? Thank you for coming and for staying after Veronica Roth. That was really nice of you. I was like, I didn't know if that was a good thing or a terrible thing. I think it turned out to be a very good thing. So um, I'm going to begin uh, by just, you know, I'm only going to read for like a few minutes from my new book, but I just want to read you a little bit. And for those of you who don't know, I write novels in verse. They're a series of poems, which if you read them all in order, tell a story. And um, it's great for you guys who have procrastinated and you have a book report due on Monday because you can read this thing so fast because there's so few words on the page. And that's how all my novels in verse are. This one's called To Be Perfectly Honest and the subtitle is A Novel Based on an Untrue Story. So. They tell me there was an accident, though I can't remember it happening. I do remember climbing into a limo with my little brother Will to visit our mom on the set of her latest film. It smelled like someone had been smoking pot in there, or maybe drinking champagne, or throwing up, or all three. I remember rolling down the window for some breathable air while Will bounced around like he always does when we're in a limo. I remember turning onto Sunset Boulevard and seeing a massive billboard of a guy wearing nothing but jeans, his fly unzipped just low enough to make me look twice. Will saw it too, 
He grinned at me and lisped in the gap where his baby teeth used to be. Sex sells. Sex sells? How does a seven-year-old even know that? I was just about to ask him, but I never got the chance. Because that's when the cop car came out of nowhere and latched onto our tail like a rabid dog. Our driver started swearing in a language I've never heard before, then flung a package out the window. I shouted at him, you better pull over and let us out right now. But the guy just whipped out a gun, waved it wildly in our direction, then turned back around and slammed his foot down hard on the gas. Suddenly, we were in one of those high-speed chases like you see on TV, zooming down one-way streets the wrong way, careening around corners, running red lights. Then there were two police cars chasing us, then three, then four. Will was squeezing my hand so hard it hurt. I was squeezing his hand, too, my heart kickboxing against my ribs. Then I heard a rumbling above us. I stuck my head out the window and saw a helicopter with a cameraman hanging out of it. I pulled my iPhone out of my purse, and a second later, my brother and I were watching our own personal drama unfolding on CNN. We got so into watching the chase that we almost forgot we were the ones being chased. But then the camera pulled back, and Will and I could see that there were six cop cars tailing us now, like we were all in some crazy motorcade rushing to get to a funeral on time. I hoped it wouldn't be ours. Then the camera pulled back even further, and we saw that in about half a mile, the road would lead us onto a bridge, a bridge that would carry us over a dark, wide, churning river. Then our driver started swearing again. Will and I glanced up from my phone, and that was when we saw that the bridge that was under construction and that halfway across the river, it simply stopped. The very last thing I remember is grabbing Will and wrapping my arms around him just as the limo slammed through a wooden barrier. Then that sick feeling you get from a sudden drop and Will screaming, to infinity and beyond. <laughs> After that, nothing. So what's it like to be dead? Well, mostly I just hang out on this comfy cloud couch in the sky, eating perfectly buttered, perfectly salted popcorn from a bowl that never gets empty, while watching EarthTube, which is sort of like a live streaming video of the whole world. If I want to see what my friends are up to, all I have to do is whisper their names, then click this golden remote, and their lives come up like a movie on my screen, as though the entire planet is just one big, huge reality show starring whoever I want it to star. It's heaven. Well, or at least it's how I imagine heaven to be. Though I have no way of knowing what it's really like because I myself am not dead. None of that stuff I told you about just now actually happened. Okay, so I'm sorry, I misled you, but once I get going, once I start reinventing reality and spinning it off in a whole new direction, it's damn near impossible for me to stop. Though the truth is, I mean the real honest to God truth about why I can't seem to keep myself from exaggerating is that my actual life sucks big time because my father's a dog catcher and my mother's a meter maid. Actually, that's not true. My father's a clown and my mother's a trapeze artist. Actually, that's not true either. I don't have a clue who my father is and my mother's a famous movie star. Actually, that is true, though I wouldn't blame you if you didn't believe me. Because, as you might have noticed, I like to stretch the truth a bit. I like to enhance, embroider, embellish. I guess what I'm trying to say is this. I am a big fat liar. The kids at school even have a joke about me. How can you tell if Colette is lying? Her mouth is open. Thank you. Oh, gosh. Thank you so much for listening. Um, so raise your hand if uh, you have never told a lie. Oh, oh are you lying? <laughs> You guys are all big, fat liars, too. Well, um, you know, when I was a teenager, I was a really big liar. I was just the worst. And, but I had to be because my mother wouldn't let me do anything, like literally nothing. Well, not literally, but, you know, almost nothing. Nothing that I wanted to do, nothing that I felt was essential to my well-being, things that feel, felt like as important to me as air and water and food. And she wouldn't let me do, do anything, like just even to go to the to the public gardens where they had these 
rock concerts that you could go to. I couldn't go there because she was afraid I was going to end up as a drug addict. I would just go to a concert, boom, drug addict. So couldn't do anything. And in order to live my life, I had to learn how to lie. And, um, but as an adult, um, I, I don't lie so much anymore. I mean, I still lie if I feel that I have to. You know, my friend comes up to me and she says, does my butt look big in this dress that I just spent my entire life savings on and I'm just crazy about? And what are you going to do? I mean, raise your hand if you would say, yeah, your butt looks really big. No, you wouldn't, right? You wouldn't do that because you want to be nice. But um, so would you like to hear the, um, one of the most insidious, most diabolical lies I ever told when I was a teen? Yeah? OK. So you have to think back in time Think back in time to a moment before cell phones when you didn't have a clock in your pocket and to find out what time it was at home. There was a clock on the wall. There wasn't really even a clock on your TV set. There was just clocks on the wall or on your nightstand. All right, that's just a little background. So I lived in Massachusetts. It was winter time, and um, my parents uh, were going away for the weekend, and um, they left. And I was left home alone. I was 14. And right after they left, a snowstorm began fa falling to the point where after about an hour after they gone, there was a foot of snow on the ground. And my best friend Betsy called me up and she said, my parents went away for the weekend. Come on over. We're going to build a massive snowman and everybody's going to be there. We're going to have a sleepover and it's going to be the best thing ever. And I didn't want to be left out, but I knew if my parents knew that I was going to Betsy's house, in the middle of a snowstorm, they would not like that because it was a mile long walk and they would think that would be dangerous. And if they knew that Betsy's parents weren't home and the boys were coming over, forget about it. There's, that was not going to happen. So I had to um, make up a convincing lie. And so I called my parents at their hotel because this was before cell phones. And I said, Mom, the electricity just went out and I'm really scared. Can I please go to Betsy's? And they took pity on me because they, they hated the thought of their little daughter home alone in the dark in their house with a snowstorm. So the, the, the truly insidious part of this lie is that before I left the house, I turned back every clock in the house 15 minutes <laughs> so that I would have support for my story and they would believe me. And so that was about as uh, insidious as it got. But um, so, uh, you know, it's, th this book is uh, about Colette. Her name is Colette. She actually made her first appearance in one of my other books, which is called One of Those Hideous Books Where the Mother Dies. It's a difficult title for a book because they say, what's the book called? I say, it's one of those hideous books where the mother dies. And they say, yeah, but what's the title? So um, anyway, uh, she makes a brief appearance in that book as the friend of the narrator. And when I started to write this book, I thought, well, who would be a great narrator for this book? I knew I wanted to write about a liar. I wanted to have an unreliable narrator. And it dawned on me that Colette was a perfect person because her mother is a famous movie star. And she feels as though nothing she ever does could ever rise to the level of her mother. She's never going to be as brilliant as her mother, as beautiful as her mother, as talented as her mother, as famous as her mother. And so she feels as though you know, she has to make her own life seem much more interesting. And she does that by lying. And, um, and, and the reason I wanted to write this book is because when I was an adult, I um, learned about some lies, very big lies, that had been perpetrated on me. And I didn't know about them until I was an adult. And it got me thinking about lies. And it got me thinking about um, the effect that lies have on the people who tell them and the effect that lies have on the people who are told the lies. And it's a pretty big deal. So that was my, you know, my reason for writing the book. And it was very easy for me to write um, the scenes with the movie star mother, because I've lived in Hollywood for the last like 35 years, and, um, or near Hollywood for the last 35 years. And so I've come into contact. You know, you just do. When you live in Hollywood, you, you know famous people, or you come into contact with famous people. And um, like, for instance, the same obstetrician who delivered Kim Kardashian's baby delivered my babies. <laughs> and John Travolta, he kissed me once right here on the cheek, right there. Woody Allen, he did card tricks for me. He's a great magician. He did card tricks for me. And my husband and I were introduced to each other by Robin Williams, 
um, and we both knew him before he was famous. And I swear to God, that is 100% true, what I just told you. In fact, my husband is kind of a sort of a semi, he's not a movie star, but he's a little bit famous because he worked for 10 years. He wrote a television show that you might have heard of. It's sort of not been on for a while, but it's called Saved by the Bell. <laughs> oh, you remembered. I should have called him up so he could hear. I'd like hold the phone out. Listen. Yeah, so that's nice. He'll be very glad to know that you were excited. Any, um, anyhow, uh, the thing about a lie is that even a very small lie can turn out to have big consequences. And in this story, one of the lies that sort of sets the whole thing in motion is when Colette lies about her age to this really beautiful, cute, you know, hot biker that she meets. And she thinks, you know, he's, he's older and she's only 15. And she thinks if, if he knew she was 15, he wouldn't want to go out with her. So she lies about her age and it had a big impact on the whole rest of her summer. And actually, the way it works out, it's had, it had as a big impact on the whole rest of her life, just one little lie. So it really um, can happen. So um, uh, I, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today is uh, the fact that one of my other books um, is frequently banned. And I just wondered, does anybody know what tomorrow is the first day of? Banned Books Week. That's right. And, um, this book of mine here is called What My Mother Doesn't Know. Um, this book is one of the top 100 most banned books of the decade. It was like the top ten, it was in the top 10 in 2004, 2005, 2010, 2011. And every time it makes the list, thank you, thank you. <laughs> not number one. <laughs> not number one. Um, but every time it makes the list, I, I'm so happy. And it's not just because, uh, you know, it's not just because it means that more people will want to read it, you know. Because if you put it in the school library and you put caution tape all around it, like, who's not going to want to read that book? Um, and, and, and not just because it'll mean more sales, but because it gives, me, uh, it gives me a certain credibility and I get to be the person that schools invite to talk about banned books. And so it's a very, it's a thing of honor that, you know, I get, I get to go. Because, you know, usually by the time a, a person has grown up and they're an adult, They've made up their mind about whether they think it's okay to ban books or not. But um, a teenager or somebody even younger might not have ever thought about it because nobody's ever tried to ban a book in their experience, and so they hadn't thought about whether it's, it's okay to do that. So I love to get to go to speak. And um, my favorite story about speaking about banned books is there was a year, a couple of years ago, when my fellow YA novelist Ellen Hopkins was uninvited from a, from a literary festival for teens in Texas. And there were supposed to be another seven other authors joining her. And in solidarity, six out of seven of those authors decided to stay home. And they had to cancel the whole event. So I happened to be speaking, yeah. <laughs> so I happened to be speaking to a, kid, a seventh grade class that, that when that was all going on. And I, so I, I wanted to bring them into thinking about it and into the discussion. So I said, well. If you were one of those other seven authors invited to that same festival that Ellen was invited to and she got uninvited, what would you have done? And this girl was like, like that. She raised her hand and I called on her and she said, well, I would have gone to the conference, but when I got there, I would have read from Ellen's book. <laughs> I just thought that was the most brilliantly insidious, wonderful thing. It was great. So, um, oh good, this is perfect timing. She just held up the sign that says 10 minutes, and so now I'm going to open it up to all of you, and please ask away, ask me questions. I will answer almost anything. <laughs> oh good, here comes one. Hi. Um, do you do anything in particular to get into the mindset of being a teenager again? I know the journals were mentioned, but do you have like a warm-up period before you start <laughs> writing? Or? I don't need a warm-up period uh, to get into the head of a teenager because I never grew up. I'm basically a teenager who is stunned every time I look in the mirror. <laughs> I'm like, what? Ah! Like with my cell phone, you know how the iPhone, it turns around, all of a sudden it aims at me and I'm like, ah! So like I, I still feel really young uh, inside, and uh, and it did help me for a while. I had teenagers in my house and in the back seat of my car all the time when I was driving them around. But now my children are 23 and 26, so um, 
I don't have as many voices currently in my life, but the beautiful thing is I get emails every day from fans, and emails are just completely, all they are is voice. They're completely filled with voice. So I have teenage voices in my head all the time, and sometimes I even borrow things from these teenage voices. Sometimes, like there was a fan who wrote to me and said, she talked to me about the skank, Amber. And I thought, wow, there's a whole character, this skank, Amber. So I put her right into a book, and um, it was great. So, um, yes? Did your parents ever find out that you lied about that? <laughs> she wants to know if my parents ever found out if I lied about that, and of course not, no, they didn't. <laughs> oh, the funny, here's a really funny thing. My mother, um, I had a party, we had like a basement in Massachusetts, I don't think you have them in Washington, but in, you have like finished rooms in your basement in Massachusetts, and I once had a party in my basement, and somebody brought a cigarette from France that had this really heavy odor to it. And my mother was convinced that I was having a pot party. <laughs> and even years later, like into adulthood, she would say, you can tell me now. Just, you can tell me. That was a pot party, wasn't it? That was a pot. And I was like, no, it was not a pot party. It was just, she just never would believe me. So even when I told the truth, she didn't believe me, which, you know, no wonder I'm so confused. Yes. Well, I'm a writer, and writer block, writer's block is just the worst. What do you do on the days when the words just don't come? And what's your favorite animated movie? My, fa my famous, what's the little Animated movie. Oh, animated movie. Well, let me answer the first question first. The first question is about writer's block. And honey, I have got the cure for you. You're, you came to the right place. Here's what you do. You stop worrying about what you write being good. You just assume that what you write is gonna stink. And then you don't feel worried about putting something down on the page. Like all of my first drafts of each of my poems I mean, they stink. They are so bad. And, and it used to worry me when I first started out. I used to think, oh, God, this is so bad. And then I'd just put it away and not write anymore for the rest of the day. But now I've done it enough that I know that no matter what, no matter how bad that first draft is, if I just close my computer and don't look at it, even for as short a period of time as like eight hours, then the next day I take it out and I can make it better. I notice all these things that I didn't notice that were wrong with it the day before, and then it becomes better. Then I put that away for another 24 hours while I'm working on the next poem in the story, and when I go back to that, I can see still more things that are wrong with it. And if I keep going and revising and revising and revising, no matter how crappy that first draft is, it always gets better. But you can't, you can't revise something if there, you don't have a crappy version of it on the page. So you have to put down the crummy version first. And you want to know my favorite animated film? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, I don't know, Fantasia maybe. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to tell you, I am a middle school librarian and I had a seventh grader take your book home. And the next day the mother came running to the <gasps> school and waving it in front of the principal. It had a part about a window. Oh yeah, and yeah, yeah. And um, so the mother said, this book has to go. My principal came and he said, get them all off the shelf. Oh no. And so I had to fight for the book and I had to tell the parents that there are books that I, they're there for a reason, that, that I, I have a whole policy of just telling the parents that those books are there for a reason. If they don't want their kids to read them, tell your children not to read them. And um, I just have to tell you that, that a bunch of the eighth grade girls came to me and said, good thing she didn't get to further into the book. So, <laughs> Although, but I tell every girl that she should read it before high school. Oh, so, you're the best. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. You know, my book still gets challenged all the time. I got uninvited just yesterday. I was, gonna, I was supposed to go to speak at a school in um, the Chicago area. And um, the teacher read through it and decided it was going to cause too much trouble, that she was going to get too much flack. So I always appreciate it if, if people go that extra mile. And if you were to read what my mother doesn't know, you would laugh. There's no sex. There's no drugs. There's no alcohol. There's, there's no curse words. You would say, why on earth did they challenge this book? It's just nuts. But you know, I'll tell you why. Because people are, the people who challenge books are idiots. <laughs> Plain and simple. <laughs> no, I mean, they read a page, they read a page out of context and they flip out. Like in, in What My Mother Doesn't Know, I'm not going to bother with that example, though that is definitely one of the two things that freaks people out the most about that book. But the other thing is um, 
there, the girl starts having an internet relationship with a guy, and she's getting more and more involved with him to the point where she's about to go meet up with him in person. And I didn't want to send the message out there to kids that, like, you should go meet people you meet online because they could be really super dangerous and they could be a weird 50-year-old who meant to do them harm. So um, I decided that the guy had to say something really disgusting. So I won't repeat what he said, but he does say something really gross, so gross that the girl says, oh, God, I'm going to delete him, never talking to him again. And, you know, what was I thinking? I could have been the next headline, you know, stu stupid teen murdered by cyber psycho. But like a, a mother who just reads the page where the guy says the gross thing and then says, this book has to go, that's what happens. And it's a shame, too, because, you know, their daughter might have benefited from reading that book. And, um, and I just want, I, I just feel that it's important as a, as a writer to be as honest as you possibly can so that kids can read the book and see themselves on the page. I want them to see themselves and go, oh my God, I felt just like that, or that's about me. Or I get emails from kids who say, thanking, thanking me for making them feel normal. And that's a pretty great honor. And I don't think I could do that um, if I started censoring myself. And so anyhow, that's, that's what I have to say on that matter. Yes. Uh, at the end of my copy of What My Mother Doesn't Know, there's a short little biography and the last sentence of the biography says, Sonia is currently working on the next book about Sophie and Robin. Uh -huh. So I was wondering if you were ever going to think about continuing that or if you left their story off in a good spot. We're, you're talking about what my mother doesn't know? Yeah. Well, guess what, honey? Well, There's a sequel. <laughs> it's called What My Girlfriend Doesn't Know. And it's told in the, in the voice of, of Robin. Sort of, it picks up right where the other story leaves off and keeps going. Okay, so. thank you. And I have time for another maybe two fast questions yes okay i just did my graduate thesis presentation on banned books and censorship ah. and i would like to know as an author how you felt when you found out your books were banned or challenged at school libraries did you feel pride did you feel that you offended your readers oh no i never have offended my readers <laughs> well, no. i felt i felt stunned because there's nothing in the book and there's so many books that are more uh, blatantly filled with stuff that might really upset somebody. So I was shocked, but, but I was pleased because it meant that I was going to get to become a, a, a spokesperson for banned books, and that's a, that's a, that feels very good. So. Keep it up. Thank you. Also, on my website, there's a tab that says banned books, and so you can see there's like a whole art, several articles there that I've written on the subject. Oh, great. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, you're welcome. One Hi. more. Um, yes. So the new book is based on Colette, who was in uh, uh, the one of those hideous books of the mother dies. Are there any other characters from one of those hideous books of the mother dies that might peek in during your new book? I don't know. Who do you want? Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I'm I'm thinking about it, but I'm not sure. So my time, I think my time here is done, and um, you've been so great. And I just want to say they had me signing books earlier, and I felt so bad because I thought, well, maybe somebody will discover me when they hear me speak, and they'll wish that I had signed their book. But you know what? I'm willing, if you are, I'll go right over to Barnes & Noble right now with anybody who wants, and I will sign you your book. So, thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.